We call it Expedition Truth. And we know you're going to love it. You ready now? Somewhere among the many competing voices in the world, truth is just waiting to be discovered. So sit back, open your mind to a world beyond your imagination. A world where truth never fears questions. Welcome to Expedition Truth with your host, Jack Ashcraft. And welcome to the program. I'm glad you joined us tonight. I think we have an interesting discussion ahead of us. Um, we have talked in the past about Al Shatru, and um, our discussions have been with Matthew Flavel for the most part. And um, we've learned about the history, some of the the beliefs and practices. But one of the things we haven't really heard about, and I think it would be interesting to do so, which is why I wanted to do tonight's show, and that is women in Al Shatru. Um, and there are there are things in any given spiritual tradition that are unique to women and their experiences that I think um, help us to understand aspects of a tradition that we otherwise might not. And so my guest tonight is a, and, I, and please forgive my pronunciation out there if you're an Al um, <laughs> uh, My guest tonight is a Githya and a Wheaton member of the Al Folk Assembly. She found her way home to the AFA in the winter of 2018 and has faithfully served her gods, her church, and its congregation. She was legally ordained in March 2021 and was announced as a Wheaton member in April of 2021. She is currently dedicated to various programs within the AFA, ranging from youth and clergy education to the official AFA History Project. She is also the presiding clergy at the Baldersoff, the third half of the Ashatru Folk Assembly, located in Murdoch, Minnesota, and provides management of the Baldershoff District, stretching from North Dakota to Wisconsin, and even south to Texas and Louisiana. My guest tonight is Brandy Callahan. Brandy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on tonight. Thank you for coming on. Um, you mentioned in uh, your bio when you shared that with me that you found your way to the AFA in the winter of 2018. Can you give us a little bit of an idea of your your background before then and what brought you to the AFA? Sure. So I've always had a deep interest in my ancestral roots and my family history. And I come from a family who's very proud of their culture and of their lineage. And I myself was actually raised as a Catholic. However, I did have influences in my life that helped me find something of a deeper connection. So I've always had that connection to my ancestral pre-Christian heritage since I was a teenager. I did f attempt to find a place where I fit in and a place where I belonged and a place that felt right. And I tried for several years to find that in various other religions. And I did find as a true in 2011, um, but I found the As a True Folk Assembly in 2018, which really is where I felt like I truly came home. Mm -hmm. What was it in, in Catholicism that you felt was missing for you? I wouldn't necessarily say that anything was missing. It just didn't feel right to me. I didn't have that connection that I felt when I was honoring my ancestors when I was on honoring my my pre-Christian religion. Mm -hmm. um, it just felt more like home to me and it just felt more right for me. Mm -hmm. Was it was the the connection that you sensed in Al Shatru one that because um, you mentioned ancestors was it one of the, the transcended belief and went to um, well blood ancestry soil the land that your family came from, did it go deeper like that? It did. It, it 
very much came to a connection to my ancestors themselves. Mm -hmm. I found myself praying more towards uh, my female ancestry, my great grandmothers, um, when I needed something rather than turning to God, I was turning to my ancestors, to my grandmothers, um, my mother's mother in particular, when I was in crisis, when I was afraid, um, when I was anxious, when I was scared, I always turned to her rather than turning to God or to Jesus or to one of the saints. Mm -hmm. And that really led me to look into my connection to my blood ancestors mm -hmm. and to their ancestors and to the legacy that they came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I suppose I can understand that because, um, you know, your great grandmother is someone, I don't know if you knew her or not. Um, I knew mine. And, um, you know, there's a different relationship there than there is with, I guess, um, a, a sort of, I don't want to say impersonal deity because I, I don't believe that Christians uh, believe in an impersonal deity, but I think for someone who is uh, who is searching for something more might find that there was a, a disconnect because there there wasn't a, a deeper connection to this deity that they believed in uh, and so could turn to someone like their great grandmother who they had a relationship with. Um, so did you talk to her in, I guess, prayer or, you know, whether yes. it be mental yes. or otherwise? Yeah, I believe that would be the best way to describe it would be, you know, praying to her, asking for her advice and simply just having a conversation. You know, I knew my grandmother very well. I knew my great grandmother very well. Um, and I had grown up with stories of my great great grandmother and her mother. Those were stories that were passed down from generation to generation. And it was something that they were very proud of. And you almost felt like I knew my great great grandmother, mm -hmm. even though I had never met her, just because mm -hmm. her memory was kept alive through the family. And I always found myself more turning to them rather than turning to a deity and mm -hmm. it was really that that got me into searching for what would my ancestors have done before mm -hmm. and that's how i i found the aesir and that's where i found my connection was through that investigation of of my ancestry mm -hmm. yeah i would imagine there were lessons that were passed down and maybe even recipes and things like that that connected you to your great-grandmother and probably beyond Definitely. Yeah. Um, so you, you find your way to the AFA. And what was your initial experience being a woman in the AFA? Being a woman in the AFA is actually something that is really special. I, have, I do have experience in other organizations that are not as a true. And what I found within the AFA that really felt right to me was the respect of the women in the church, um, that we have a voice in the church, that we really do have a role in As a True and in the As a True Folk Assembly. Um, I, I really found that to be refreshing and encouraging and empowering all at the same time. So you do you feel like there was a, uh, well, let me ask you, is How Should True patriarchal? It is. It is patriarchal because our society really back then and now is patriarchal. Mm -hmm. Our, you know, our the As True Folk Assembly is led by Alistair Lagothi Matthew Flavel. Historically, our families and our kindreds and our churches were run by Goldar, by, by men. Mm -hmm. You know, they chose the direction and they were responsible for leading their people and their families to the Aesir. Yeah, I trust me. I have no problem with that at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, you know, there might be women out there listening who are thinking, "Well, patriarchy." Of course, the typical leftist, you know, that's mindless. And that's unfortunate. Yes, that's unfortunate. One thing I really do like about As a True and the As a True Folk Assembly is there is there is not an absence ab absence of men 
or an absence of women, there are both men and women. There is both the masculine and the feminine. They both have a voice and, and they're not competing with one another for their place in the spotlight or their place of authority or who's right and who's wrong. There's no competition between our men and women. Um, and that's something that's really wonderful to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's uh, what's known as complementarianism. And that's when uh, each has a respective role and there is a hierarchy and that hierarchy is respected and honored um, by everyone within their respective roles. And in this case, specifically, uh, masculine and feminine roles. What are some of the, the roles unique to women in Alsha True? There are several. Uh, one of the most important roles that we have as women in Asa True is the support of one another. We have a very fierce and loving sisterhood of women in the As a True Folk Assembly. Um, we have a very strong network of women that have built a very strong bond together, and they're there to help one another, to teach and inspire each other. You know, they're there to support each other when they're down and celebrate them when things are good. And we have a way of understanding each other in a way that only sisters really can. So that's one thing I have found in the As a True Folk Assembly that is absolutely beautiful. And in my circumstances with my, my previous organizations I was part of, is unique to the As True Folk Assembly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I'm most familiar with uh, some of the neo-pagan groups out there that, you know, they, they claim to be, well, they're, they're all pretty leftist, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what you've got going on in those groups is really neo-Marxism under the guise of, of paganism. And it's not even usually a real paganism. Um, and the, the, the thing is that there's a conflating of or an inversion of the natural order of masculine and feminine there. And did you experience that when you were sort of finding your way toward uh, to as true before i was as true i did see that in the neo-pagan circles um mm. there was a very heavy focus on women's empowerment which when taken too far which it is very often done takes the importance of the masculine element away it's very important to have that duality, to have that masculine, that feminine, and you, you shouldn't be in competition with one another because when you are, it's very easy to let one overpower the other and the mm -hmm. others lose their importance in that role. Mm -hmm. uh, since I found my way here to Azatru, I have not witnessed that. That's good. I wouldn't imagine you would find that in the AFA. No. <laughs> I don't think they'd put up with somebody who came in and tried to disrupt um, things in that way. Um, so give me an idea of what you went through to be, be ordained clergy. I did go through the Godar program, which is a two year course, one year of study, um, and also, um, you know, showing that you are competent in leading a district, in counseling, in providing religious services. Um, it is a year of a pretty intense study. The program itself is not easy. Um, I did have direct mentorship from several several of the Godar of the Azatru Folk Assembly and from the Asherah Gadi himself, um, teaching me very hands-on on the expectations of a Gidea, um, the roles of a Gidea, and the responsibilities of serving your folk and of your church. Mm -hmm. So you had to learn what the rituals, history, traditions, etc.? Yes, absolutely. Everything from how to conduct a bloat, which is our main ritual, ritual to how to counsel some, someone who's in crisis, um, or how hmm. to help someone find, you know, things as simple as, you know, helping someone connect with services that they may need, you know, mm -hmm. a family that's in crisis, um, or fam just a family that's in need, or just someone who needs to talk someone who just needs someone to be there, um, and also a way to provide that spiritual guidance, mm -hmm. give them a way to connect to their gods and goddesses when they're, when they're in need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something that, uh, that Matthew Flavel mentioned, I believe in our last discussion together, was that the AFA is, is 
actually looking to develop a structure whereby it can care for its own in times of need, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, sort of its own social welfare uh, net uh, when it's needed. Um, do you see do you see women such as yourself taking an active role in that? We do. One of our main roles as women in the as a true folk assembly is to be called what we call a frith weaver, um, to build those relationships and those reciprocal bonds between sisters and between children and between families. And for example, with our our ladies who are folk builders in Githias, to actually take that a step further and build the relationship between our families with the church itself. And we do that through our counseling and we do that through our educational programs, our homeschool program that we're developing, as well as our clergy program, our adult education program as well. Um, But to give them that opportunity to help build with their church and build a relationship with their church. And we Mm -hmm. also have uh, services such as our folk services that can assist families who are in need or as a Githia perhaps help them give them some guidance on where they can turn in their communities or where they can turn in their church for assistance. So you mentioned a homeschool curriculum. Yes. Um, I'll ask this knowing the answer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What made what made you what made you decide to develop a homeschool curriculum? <laughs> the homeschool curriculum is something really to make sure that we can take our values, our traditions, and our religion and teach that to our children right alongside reading, writing, and arithmetic. Mm-hmm. Um, all of the other required or I shouldn't say required, but uh, all the other information that is pumped into our children to try to get them to think, a certain way and be in a certain way, oftentimes that is in conflict with our traditional values and our conservative thoughts. And homeschooling your child is a direct opportunity to make sure that you are instilling the values and traditions onto your children that you truly want passed on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I home, we homeschool our, our son as well. Public schools are, are a uh, pit of hell, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, they teach children, especially uh, white children, to hate themselves mm-hmm. through through critical race praxis, which, you know, they claim all day long they're not teaching it, but we all know they are. We see it. Mm-hmm. Um, there have been children who have committed suicide because of this. I mean, it's just flat out evil. So uh, I applaud your efforts toward uh, homeschooling. Um, that brings me to another question. And uh, that is children. Um, how does your faith inform how you raise children? We raise our children to worship the Aesir. We raise our children with a traditional mindset. We raise our children with the conservative values that we have. Um, we very much want to raise the next generation of Azatru, we very much want them to continue the legacy of the Azatru Folk Assembly. Everything that we do, whether it's creating these education programs or even building the three beautiful hofs that we have, we are doing this for our children. Mm -hmm. We are doing this so that they have a place of beauty to worship their gods, so that they have a place to gather with their folk, so that they have a place to celebrate. And everything that we do is with them in mind. So essentially, the the focus is not just on the present, but on the future, and um, and building something that uh, will allow your children to to have what self respect, um, uh, healthy understanding and appreciation for their unique history, etc. Absolutely, absolutely, you know. Our Assyria Gothi has always said his children and now my children are never going to know a world without Hoffs dedicated to their gods. And that hasn't happened in, in thousands of years. Mm-hmm. Um, we are building a legacy and we are building a future. And it's it's not for us. It's for our children and our children's children. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's important that uh, that you're... you're putting together a homeschool curriculum toward uh, that end as well, because they're going to be hit with a lot of influences in uh, contemporary culture that is going to try to undo everything you're trying to accomplish. 
in what other ways are you um, helping to uh, counteract those negative cultural influences? Involving your children in your daily as a true, involving your children in events and in celebrations and in worship at a hof, bringing your children and introducing them to other children just like them at these mm-hmm. events. Uh, that is one of the most wonderful things that I've seen being a mother myself is is bringing my two children into the As True Folk Assembly. They have met children who have the same religious beliefs, the same, the same values. They don't have to worry about if they're going to be judged for their religion or their mindsets or their values. They don't have to worry about that. They're with mm-hmm. like-minded people. And it encourages them and it and it lets them thrive and really be who they are um, without worry that they're going to be judged for their religion or traditions. Mm-hmm. Would you would you permit uh, your child to marry outside the faith? To marry outside the faith, to be to be honest, and it is just a simple truth, a man and a woman together in marriage really are moving towards a single goal. Mm-hmm. Um and it's very, very much encouraged and much easier and avoids a lot of conflict when you have two people with the same ideals moving in the same direction. Mm-hmm. So I would agree what, with you. You know, it's, it, it's, it's very much a matter of being in tune and in step with each other. You mm-hmm. know, it, it causes a lot less, a lot less slowdown, a lot less conflict when we all have the same idea of where we're going and how we're raising our how we're raising our children and how we're making our home. As a true itself is a is a daily religion. It's it's not something you only do when you're at the Hof. It's something you do every single day. And mm-hmm. it's something that affects your household every single day. And it is so much more easier and so much more beautiful when you have a man and a woman going in the same direction. I agree with you 100%. I mean, you know, most of our listeners are Christians and some of them out there might now, right now be thinking, what? They couldn't marry a Christian? Well, I mean, how many Christians want their children to marry a Buddhist or an atheist? Or, you know? as, yeah, as a mother, that's that's my hope and dreams that they meet someone within the church and carry on this legacy with, with a wife of their own and, and children of their own. Of course. That makes complete sense. And, and I can appreciate that desire. Um, I think it's a, it's a healthy approach. If you really believe your faith, and you've spent all this time and effort to raise your children with these values and with this this same faith, and of course you're going to want them to to marry in that faith that is a part of your your family, a part of your history, a part of your your ancestry. That makes complete sense. So, um, yeah. So if my Christian listeners are out there right now, huffing and puffing at that, uh, you know. Christians do the same. Let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we've got a we got a break coming up. So we'll talk with Brandy Callahan more on the other side of the break. You're listening to Expedition Truth with Jack Ashcraft. It's just good, clean fun. Intelligent talk for the discerning mind. Share your thoughts on the show by calling 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Find us worldwide on Skype at KCOR Radio or jump into our live chat room at www.kcorradio.com. Now the world will begin hearing us. More truth than humanly possible after these brief words from our sponsors. Every year around the world, thousands of golden retrievers are abused, abandoned, and neglected, and they need your help. Goldens Without Borders is a 501c3 not-for-profit company located in the heart of Southern Nevada. They focus on golden retrievers in countries where neglect and mistreatment is of the worst imaginable. Even the smallest donations go a long way to saving a life and helping put these beautiful dogs into loving, forever homes. Come be a part of a network of people working hard to make the world a safer and more humane place for all living creatures. To make a donation, or if you're interested in adopting or fostering, please visit 
goldenswithoutborders.org. Goldens Without Borders, help make a difference today. This is KCOR Radio, coming to you live from Las Vegas. We interrupt this program to annoy you and make things generally irritating. At the end of the day, we turn the lights down in the KCOR studio. Oh, sweet. And crank up the hottest club songs from around the world. This is the future. The Grind, mixed by Tina Marie, your Vegas vixen of the high desert. What about the body? What kind of body? Good body. Nice body. Every night from 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Pacific, the best three hours of commercial free music. New music first. It's time to stand up and dance your ass off. The Grind, nightly and exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Come on, it's kind of hot. This is KCOR Radio, streaming online. Monday nights are about to become hauntingly good as Reverend Sean Whittington possesses the airwaves with Vegas Supernatural. Vegas Supernatural. Tune in every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern for Vegas Supernatural exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. There's a war raging between good and evil. The question is, which side are you fighting on? Tune in Monday nights as Reverend Sean Whittington sets the new standard for paranormal radio with some of the most influential personalities in the world today. Vegas Supernatural, hosted by Reverend Sean Whittington, every Monday night at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The one show even the devil doesn't want you to hear. to the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Broadcasting from the heart of Las Vegas, Nevada. The base is so large, it has to draw most of its power from the nearby nuclear fusion plant. The future of radio is here and now. And now. Welcome back to Expedition Truth. Expedition Truth. This place is incredible. Intelligent talk for the discerning mind. To be on the show live, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. What are you waiting for? Worldwide callers, use Skype name KCOR Radio. Share your thoughts of the show on Twitter at KCOR Radio using hashtag KCOR. Even better, join like-minded individuals in our live chat room at KCORradio.com. Now, back to Expedition Truth with Jack Ashcraft, where the truth never fears questions. Welcome back. We're glad you're joining us. If you just popped in, we are talking with Brandy Callahan about... Alsha True, she is a clergyman, clergywoman, sorry, in uh, the Alsha True Folk Assembly. And we're discussing uh, women's experience in Alsha True and what that is like. And uh, Brandy, I know you're married. I'm assuming you're a mother as well. Yes, I am. Okay. So, um, you know, we've been talking about uh, the education of children, raising them, marriage, etc. Now, during the break, there was there was a term you used in in the discussion we were having that I don't even want to hazard trying <laughs> to say because I will destroy it. Uh, but I wanted to know more about it. Can you can you share what that is? I believe Frith Weaver, correct? Yes, yes, please. Yes. So one of a, a woman in Astro, one of her most important roles is truly the role of the Frith Weaver. Uh, Frith itself is a term that is often too simply classified as just peace. But Frith is so much more than that. Frith is defense of one another. Frith is that reciprocal give and take and gifting cycle between person to person, family to family. Um, Frith is really that bond that just weaves individuals together. And as women, we have this very unique talent 
for creating peace, for creating uh, relationships with other women, with you know bonding our children together, whether it's a play date or just bringing each other over for for Sunday dinners at our houses and letting our children play together. That is something that just really comes natural to a woman and to a mother is to help those children network and help those children create those bonds themselves and mm -hmm. in essence create the future. Um, we also create that frith with with the families. You know, there's there's often if there's any uh, strife or if there's any miscommunications, a lot of the time women have a very unique ability to work that out in a softer way, to take the emotions and to take all of those things and just tie it into something that does not require fists and does not require is, is harsh words and does not require a competition of who's winning, but more along the line of, of smooth that out and, and find the common ground. You know, that's something that's very natural to a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we do. You know, we bind children together. We bind ourselves together as sisters. We, we bind our families from one to another. We bind those families to the church itself and, and in that to the ACR themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. Um, the, the characteristics, the qualities of the feminine um, cannot be replaced. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we look at the culture at large and um, how mothers are often not in the home because they're forced to work mm -hmm. um, or they choose to work because they think that's what they're supposed to do as strong women um, and how the, the cultural vampires on the left and some some on the uh, on the right um, would have us believe that uh, a mother and father are not important to to raising children um, I, I think that it's refreshing to find a faith like yours that takes a healthy organic approach to that and recognizes reality Mm -hmm. <laughs> that both are needed and women are very important to developing the qualities of compassion and peace, et cetera, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. My, you know, I had a, I had an uncle that once always said, a man builds the house, but the woman makes the home. You know, the man builds the walls, but it's, it's the woman that maintains that home. Mm -hmm. um, it's the woman that that is the healer and the teacher and the bearer and the creator and the peacemaker. Um, you know, while the man is is protecting that and building that. And it's very much a role of a woman, you know, to allow that man to have that dream and to and to build those things and to be that woman that helps push that dream forward, to be the woman that helps fill that home with compassion and with spirituality and with love you mm -hmm. know that is most definitely a role of a woman yeah the hearth keeper yes absolutely you know you you're it, it, it's wonderful for men to have these big beautiful dreams and it is so wonderful to be that person that makes those dreams happen that helps them on that path you know we don't have to compete with them let's all go forward in the same direction mm -hmm. are there specific traditions that uh, you keep as a family? My family personally? Yeah, yeah, they come from, they spring forth from your from your faith. We do have several. We do have, um, you know, our major holidays and celebrations. Uh, we do have specific traditions for each one of those. Um, we just had our spring, um, it's a spring holiday called Ostara, which is the coming of spring. One of the traditions that I've done with my children since they were very young, um, you know, the, the symbology between the rabbit and the eggs, for example, um, is very relevant to Ostara, very much like it is for Easter for a Christian. Um, one thing that we've always done is we always hollowed out an egg and rolled up a wish or a hope or a goal that we had. And we would paint the egg and we would roll that up and put it inside the egg. And my children would put it in a nest on our family altar. And every morning they would go down and they would whisper encouragement to that egg to grow it and to help it manifest into reality mm -hmm. um, as part of their morning offerings. So that's one spring tradition that we had. 
just coming to mind with the current holiday. Right, right. Yeah, I think those kinds of traditions are important. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, families in the West used to have these traditions. In the East, you still see them. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the West, not so much. Um, and, and it's a shame. Mm-hmm. So do you do you have uh, any experience of women coming into the AFA who who are fresh out of the um, culture of death that we live in today and bring in some of those attitudes with them and have to unlearn them? Yes, and I do believe that that network of women that we have that I talked about on our first our first part of the show here, that really strong bond that the women have formed together, we have had women that have come in, um, you know, either for one reason or another have found the As True Folk Assembly, and they bring ideas that may sometimes be in conflict with the true north of As True. Um, the prime example of that would be this myth of a shield maiden you see a you see a lot of women these days um whether on one social media or TikTok or youtube where they paint their face and wield an axe yeah you know that is not the role of a woman in as a true you know i mean it's it's silly in a way but sometimes we do need to you know bring those women in their in their ideals and, and and let them know where their true strength lies. Your true strength of a woman does is not based on how you have your hair braided and how revealing your leather dress is and how far <laughs> you can swing that axe. That's not your strength of, as a woman. Your strength as a woman is found in your sisterhood. It's found in your relationship with the Aesir. It's found in your relationship with your Deesir, which is our, our female ancestors, um, you know, looking back on our deeds and on our words and on our actions, you know, that's your strength. Your strength is is the history that you keep alive and your strength in immortality is the legacy that you leave mm-hmm. and the future that you create for your children. You know, I, I was just looking at your photograph here with your bio. And this is what strikes me. You are very modestly dressed. Um, I don't see a lot of makeup on your face, if any at all. No, um, I don't. <laughs> if and, and your hair is its natural color, thank God. <laughs> um, uh, if If someone saw you on the street as modest as you are, um, as traditional as you look, and I'm sure your behavior matches it, they would think that you were a very conservative Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, is is this sort of modesty typical of women in the AFA? The women of the AFA know where their true strength is. Um, the women of the AFA know who they are as women. That is one of the benefits of being part of of this church. Um, we don't have to be extravagant. We don't need to be ferocious warrior women, like Xena warrior princess or something like that. We don't need to do that. Um, and we're not we're not in competition with other women in society. We know who we are. Um, we are strong conservative, traditional, family-oriented women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I think what really strikes me is that even, and this is a sad reality, is that even within Christianity, uh, even some conservative circles of Christianity, uh, women dress like the surrounding culture quite often. And that has the, the effect of sexualizing them, of... Um, I think marring their inherent dignity. And what I'm getting from you is that Al Shatru really uh, demands that that inherent dignity be honored. I truly feel that femininity is much more beautiful than 
than being sexualized. Being feminine, being comfortable in that is so much more important than attracting attention just for the sake of attracting attention. Mm. Um, one thing that you will notice when you see pictures um, of our gatherings or of our services, a lot of the women look absolutely stunning in these beautiful dresses or the fascinators on their heads. Everybody loves to look their best, you know, and, and we encourage our folk, men and women, that when you go before your gods and when you go before your ancestors, bring the best of yourself not only in thought, not only in spirit, not only in state of mind, but also in state of physicalness, your, your physical body, the way you dress and the way you hold yourself. We bring the best of ourselves to our gods. We bring the best of ourselves to our ancestors and we bring the best of ourselves to the Hoffs and to our events. Well, you're a beautiful, intelligent woman and, and you know, your husband's definitely blessed. Um, Thank you. Uh, um, so, what do you think then is the the most important thing in Alshatru for a woman who is perhaps interested in coming in but is a little nervous? What do you think the most important thing is for her to know? I think the most important thing for a woman who is interested in joining the Azatru Folk Assembly is to know that there are other women in the As a True Folk Assembly. Um, we have a very, very large group of, of strong women who would help her in any way that they could. Um, when we have uh, events and, and celebrations at our Hofs and at other areas, we make time to get our women together specifically, just us women and spend time together and build bonds together. She would find support in the As a True Folk Assembly. She would find education in the As a True Folk Assembly. She would find a home for herself and her children in the church. Mm -hmm. choosing, choosing media and entertainment in the home is something that's very important today, as you know, I'm sure. We have to be very careful about what we let come into our homes. Um, how do you screen what your family sees and hears? And uh, what, what forms of entertainment would you recommend? To be honest, we don't have cable in my home. Mm -hmm. We have uh, streaming services that are, that are monitored with parental settings um, and they they see what is age appropriate and they see what we believe is ethically appropriate for them. Um, I it am has also, to be hard to find. <laughs> it is. It can be. My children fortunately are avid readers, avid yes. readers. So they can constantly be found with a book most of the time. Um, you know, for for example, my, my youngest son was recently gifted a book on uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt that he is reading through and absolutely loves. Um, and that was a book that was given to him um, just to give him some inspiration and motivate, motivation in the things that he goes through. Um, and that was actually gifted to him by, by our Ashira Gothi's wife. You know, that's the consideration that our women put into each other's families and each other's children. You know, we, we reach out to each other, we take care of each other. You know, and that's 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 an example of a true frith weaving right there, knowing that, you know, my son was struggling with some some asthma issues and Teddy Roosevelt did the same thing. And here's a book on how he overcame it, you know, to think of another's children as if they were your own. I mean, that's something beautiful and so rare in today's modern age. Um, I know I got a little sideline there, but that's just no, that's, an example okay. of, how, okay. <laughs> of the support that, that this church and this religion gives to the families that we have. So there are, are there forms of uh, entertainment that you would recommend to parents who want to avoid the same things that you do? Absolutely. Bring your children to one of the hoffs of the Azure True Folk Assembly or one of the meet and greets or many moot moots that we have around the country. Take part in some games of physical exertion and and excellence and listen to some lore studies and reading of, of mythology and learn some traditional dancing while you're there. That's mm. my best advice for entertainment for anyone looking for very good traditional values mm -hmm. instilled upon your children. Come out to an event, come out to the Hof, come out to a moot. 
spend time with the folk. Actually sounds like fun. <laughs> it is. It's a great time. And, and kids usually love mythology. They do. They absolutely do. I mean, it's fascinating stuff when you get into it. I mean, I took a class on it in college, and I found it fascinating even then as an adult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it sounds to me like that the role of women is is very important in, in Alshatru. Um, is that somehow connected to, you know, we, you've talked about the gods. There are goddesses, I'm, I'm assuming. Yes. Um, is there a connection there? And if so, what is it? Yes, absolutely. Um, the gods are very important in our in our lore, um, but the goddesses are also very important in our lore. And our Githias uh, primarily are those that, that conduit and that connection to that feminine power of our goddesses. Um, we have our main goddesses that everyone knows about. We have Frigga, you know, the wife of Odin. We have Freya. Um, we have also lesser known goddesses that not everybody knows so much about. You know, for example, we have the goddess Saga, you know, who, who serves Odin beverages from a golden cup and listens to his stories. You know, she's someone that we get inspiration from to make sure that we preserve our history and our memories and we, and we keep those memories alive. You know, we have um, the goddess Air, who was known as the greatest doctor and the healer. You know, those are all things that we as women can take inspiration from. You know, as women, it is our role to make sure that our the memories of our children are preserved, that we remember those first steps, those first words, um, and that we also share the stories of our ancestors with our children. And at the same time, um, with air, there's nothing more healing than a mother's touch. You know, there's women have a natural ability to heal, whether it be physical, spiritual, or emotional. And mm -hmm. we can find examples of that in our goddesses. That brings me up a question. Do you, do you, uh, how do you feel about modern medicine? Um, I would assume you're not adversarial to it, but do you also look toward more, I guess, homeopathic remedies? Now, that's really going to be determined by the needs of the family. Um, you know, the, the As a True Folk Assembly itself is not anti-vaccination or anything like that, but we do feel that they should do what is best for their families medically um, and, and, and what it is that they feel is correct. Um, whether it's um, to vaccinate or not to vaccinate, whether it's to seek chemo or not to seek chemo, you know, that's really something that... Uh, they need to evaluate at a family level, at an individual level. But that being said, should they ever have a spiritual question that they want to work through in regards to that, we have Gothar available that would most definitely help them in that in that spiritual journey to decide what was right for them. Mm -hmm. How has your family reacted to your faith? My family is one of the most supportive families that you'll ever find in regards to Azatru. Um, I do share the story that, you know, I come from a very Catholic background. However, my parents have seen the improvements and how I've how I've matured and grown as a person and how I personally have become a better person because of Azatru, because of my relationships with my gods and my goddesses and my ancestors you know i strive to be that woman now that my grandmother would be proud of i want my great grandmother to be proud of me i want my children to be proud of me um, i want my gods to see my deeds um and it has just changed me into a much more spiritual and aware person and, and in turn has turned me into such a better person a better wife a better mother, a better friend. Yeah, you know, in talking to you just in this brief time, um, I can I can tell you're a good wife, good mother, and uh, an intelligent woman. Um, it's hard to imagine you not being those things, and I think that's a credit to you, uh, to your tenacity, you know, sticking to your faith, and to uh, to living what you believe to be true. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, are there any uh, books or anything that you could recommend to women 
that would help them specifically on Alshatru? Absolutely. For those who are just starting out in Azatru, we always recommend uh, Azatru and Native Spirituality by Stephen McNallan. He is the 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 father of modern Azatru, and he is the founder of the Azatru Folk Assembly. So his book is most definitely on the to read pile. Um, also, Lady with a Mead Cup. I definitely would recommend reading that book, um, and in turn with that Beowulf as well, the story of Beowulf. Um, those are probably the two as a woman that I would start with, those yeah. two books. Yeah, I think uh, McNallan, didn't he retire a few years back? Yes, he's still retired, but he's still around here kicking up dirt and having <laughs> a good time. He's still here with us. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I knew he had retired. Um, and if I remember right, he comes from a Catholic background as well. He sure does. He sure does. That's what I remember, yeah. Um, I had a brief interaction with him before his retirement actually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh was talking to him about the possibility of coming on the show but i think he was probably shying away because of the 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 usual abuse that i'm sure he he had received mm -hmm. <laughs> yes yes he's a wonderful man he was a nice guy when i talked to him definitely yes. and uh matthew flava was um uh, impressive Oh very, yes, very intelligent guy, um, really easy to talk to, knowledgeable. So I have to say that my impression of the Alshatri Folk Assembly is, uh, on the whole, very positive. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you coming on to fill in that gap for us about uh, the women in Alshatri and. Uh, Mrs. Callahan, I wish you and your family the best. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here from us here at Expedition Truth. That's the end of tonight's expedition. Take care, everyone. Have a good evening. You've been listening to Expedition Truth, hosted by Jack Ashcraft. It's time to believe in the unbelievable. Live every Thursday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. For more information on Jack Ashcraft, the show, as well as his guests, please visit his website at www.paleoorthodoxy.com. Expedition Truth. Intelligent talk for the discerning mind. Why? Because the truth never fears questions. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a shack just south of Area 51. Wait, that doesn't exist. This is the